Good evening. Welcome, welcome to the 2015 Koch Institute Image Awards. I am Anna De Konink. I'm the executive director here at the Koch Institute. And uh, this is our 17th With Inside program since we opened the building four years ago, and our fifth Image Awards exhibition. Um, I think I've said this every year, but I actually think this has to be our best one yet. <laughs> The, normally I say a few words about the Koch Institute, but because we have a packed program tonight with lots of presenters that are just very keen to dive into the science behind their beautiful images, I'm going to hand it straight over to Erica Reinfeld, our public program outreach coordinator. Um, and she will um, be the moderator for the evening and tell you a little bit of, about the Koch Institute along the way. I have to say that um, we're very proud of the work that we do here at the Coke, obviously, and of our place within MIT's community. And so tonight's event is, um, I think, a beautiful way to showcase that. So thank you for coming, and Erica. All right, and I'm also going to point out on the bottom of the slide here our hashtag KI images. Hopefully, you've seen some of the prompts around the galleries, and you can tell us what inspires you, what's exciting, what's going on. Um, but yes, let's jump into things. Um, but because it is an award ceremony, I have to channel the award ceremony and give lots of thanks to the people um, that we'd like to thank. Um, the Koch Institute is grateful to Charles B. and Ann Johnson, whose generous gifts established the Philip Alden Russell 1914 Gallery and provides ongoing support for the renewal of our exhibition, so the ability to put up new images every year. We're very grateful for that. We're also grateful to our colleagues at uh, the Cell Picture Show, as well as the MIT Museum, who are working to find new ways to get the K Koch Institute Image Awards out into a wider audience, uh, as well as the welcome images in London, but I'll say a little bit more about them later. Um, and then I also want to thank our judging panel. They have the very difficult task of choosing 10 images out of more than 100 submitted. I think some of them are in the audience. I would love for them to stand or wave. Um, here's, here are their names. Um, but, oh, they're sitting in the back very shyly, but Wendy and Mandar and Jonathan, so thank you for helping us put together this exhibition. All right, and then finally, I have to thank everybody who submitted images, um, not just the ones on display, but all the images uh, through the years. We post them to our gallery's website, so those will be going up. Um, in the next few weeks uh, to see the runners up. Um, and of course, because this is the event that it is, all the people who support the people who submit images, whether it is through funding or through moral support, I know there are a lot of you out there, so thank you to all of you for making this exhibition possible. <laughs> all right. So the way this is going to work is we've promised you lightning talks. The presenters have been told they have three to five minutes to present their image in an encapsulated way. And that makes, actually, that's going to make a lot of sense for the first image. Um, but let's do what we wanted to do and take a closer look at the images. Um, this is our first image, which happens to be of capsules. But you'll hear more about that. Um, we're cho we chose to present the images today in the order in which the presenters appear in your program. It happens to be alphabetical. Um, but I'm actually really excited that this one turned out to be the first image, because these are sugar polymers. And it gives me a chance to tell you that the Koch Institute was founded uh, in a chocolate factory. <laughs> um, sorry, MIT's cancer research program began in a, a chocolate factory across the street behind you. Uh, and that happened in 1974. Back then, it was mostly biologists. And then in 2007, the vision for cancer research at MIT was expanded to include uh, engineers as well. Um, so that's what, that's what the Koch Institute for Integrative Cancer Research is all about, bringing together biologists and engineers. This image does happen to be a good example of that. It's chemical engineering with some profound biological implications. Um, it also has the distinction of what may be the best title presenter combination a printed program has ever seen. Um, Andrew Bader, Omid Vesa, and Arturo Ves um, Vegas are masters of disguise. And Andrew is here to represent this image tonight.
Okay, so I'm Andrew Bader, and I work in the laboratories of Daniel Anderson and Robert Langer here at the Koch Institute. Um, this project uh, involves the encapsulation of uh, cellular devices, which com is composed of two components. The first component is cells, which are engineered to produce a variety of therapeutic factors against disease. The second component is a hydrogel protective network that surrounds these cells. Uh, this hydrogel coating is important in defending these cells from the host immune system. And one important uh, sort of aspect of this coating is that it's semi-permeable, allowing oxygen and nutrients in and the therapeutic factors that the cells are producing out. This is an example of cells that have been encapsulated in hydrogel spheres in our laboratory. One of the issues that we face is that the hydrogel spheres themselves are actually recognized by the immune system. Um, our lab actually looks at alterations to different aspects of these hydrogels, such as size, geometry, and materials composition, um, in an effort to make super biocompatible uh, hydrogel capsules. Uh, these hydrogel capsules are considered to be masters of disguise. <laughs> Um, so this is an example of sort of a contrast between two different versions of capsules. Um, the conventional capsules that have been researched up until this point and used in therapies um, are not very good masters of disguise and have been uh, caked over with fibrotic uh, coatings and um, immune cells that have attached to them in an effort to destroy them. And therefore, uh, these capsules are no longer effective and can no longer produce the necessary therapeutic uh, proteins and factors. However, in contrast, the uh, capsules that we have developed here in the, the Langer-Anderson lab, um, they are larger and made out of different polymers and are therefore much more biocompatible and can successfully evade the immune system of the host with which they're transplanted into. Therefore, these cells can produce therapeutics for um, a much longer period of time. Um, one of the benefits of transplanting less biocompatible capsules is that you can generate uh, beautiful images such as these that go in uh, win Coke Image Awards. And um, <laughs> so this is actually something that you don't necessarily want from your device. Um, the hydrogels that make these capsules do not produce any of these colors. Um, the colors are actually staying specific to different components of immune cells and proteins that are attacking the capsules in an effort to wall them off and destroy them. Um, in doing so, they create an uh, impermeable barrier where um, the nutrients that are necessary for therapeutic cell survival do not get through. Those therapeutic cells die and therefore can no longer produce um, the therapeutics that they're designed to produce. Um, our goal is to produce capsules, and we have produced capsules um, that perform better than this. So with our alterations, um, capsules that are imaged in the same way would actually produce a completely black blank pictures with um, no immune cells surrounding them. This meaning that at that point, at the same period of time, after the same period of time, they're still producing therapeutic factors. And our goal is to create devices um, of this nature that could potentially be transplanted once into a patient and last throughout the entirety of a patient's life. Um, I would like to thank uh, Professor Langer, Anderson, and my postdocs, Arturo and Omid, for uh, allowing me to present. Thank you. All right, so I know people are gonna have a lot of questions about these images. That's part of why we uh, ordered dessert. Um, we're gonna save questions till the end um, so that after all presenters have presented, you can come up and talk to them either here or in the galleries and ask them specific questions that you have about the images. So thank you, Andrew. I'm very glad you didn't submit a plain black image. <laughs> um, so we are going to move on. We're going to head down to the third floor of the Koch Institute um, to visit the Heinz Laboratory and talk about, so this was uh, Andrew's, Andrew Omid and Arturo's image was about drug uh, delivery. This one is in a very, very long-term way about drug development, um, which seems a bit odd. It's a biology lab and 
it has something to do with fish, as you can probably tell from the title. So the question is, what does that have to do with cancer drugs? Um, the, the Koch Institute is an NCI-designated basic cancer research center. We're one of seven in the country. Um, and this means we place a fundamental emphasis on biological discovery as a pathway for developing new technologies, new treatments in the fight against cancer. Um, so the Heinz Lab, in particular, focuses on metastasis and the interactions that healthy and cancerous cells have among each other. Um, and this is the foundation on which we are able to develop uh, new targets uh, for drugs. So as you'll see from David's um, presentation, this is a necessary and challenging step in our mission to understand and better treat cancer. So David, you're up. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you all for coming. So as you heard, I'm a um, graduate student uh, in the lab of uh, Richard Hines, and our lab studies metastasis. And so it turns out that for tumor cells, uh, in order for them uh, to metastasize, they actually need a lot of help. And um, a lot of this help is actually coming from non-tumor cells. So normal cells, the tumor cells trick um, into helping them. And so this image is actually in a uh, zebrafish. Um, it's a small tropical fish. Some of you may even have them at home. And it's been genetically modified to be transparent. And so the green are tumor cells that have been injected into circulation, and the red are blood vessels. And then uh, over the course of a few days, these tumor cells, which are currently trapped in the blood vessels, are going to leave and form new tumors. And the whole purpose of this project is to develop a system in which we can image metastasis over time, right? because it's a very uh, dynamic process. And currently, we're limited to looking at fixed tissue sections, which means that we can only look at single time points from different animals. And to kind of give you an idea about how difficult it is to study metastasis when you can only look um, at single time points from different animals, I'd, I'd like to do a quick thought experiment. So let's all pretend that we're aliens and we've just arrived on the planet Earth. And we know that humans play this game called baseball. But you know we don't know anything about baseball. And the only information we have actually uh, are just are just still images from different points in different games. And so uh, from just looking at these, we can learn a few things. We can learn there are different types of um, individuals involved. There are some players here uh, who wear helmets. There are some who wear, uh, who wear hats. And then there's also this individual here who's in dark clothing and seems to be signaling. But we don't really understand what's going on, because sometimes the players wearing the helmets are holding a bat and standing over here. Other times they're running. Right? We don't know what happens to make them move from holding the bat uh, to running. But if now we can suddenly watch movies, right? now we can really understand how the game works. So, okay. uh, so now we see that the player in the helmet uh, is running because he just um, hit a home run. And now he's running around the bases. And now we understand how the interactions between pitchers and batters work. And if we watch the, this next image, now we see that the umpire is actually signaling because there's a strike. And now we can understand how, how the umpire interacts with the other players around home plate and is regulating what's going on there. And then finally, if we look at this image, now we can see that he's, OK, he, he's throwing the ball to home plate. And we see how the, how the um, infield works and how the interaction between the infield leads to the, to the out at first base. And then if you watch enough uh, Red Sox baseball, every once in a while you'll see one of these rare interactions <laughs> where it seems like there's some kind of uh, object in the middle that's recruiting everybody. <laughs> And so it's the same thing with metastasis. <laughs> so right, this is in um, a live fish. The green are, are platelets, the white are tumor cells, and the red are blood vessels. And we can watch images over short time periods like this, so we can watch really quick transient interactions in a living animal. And then we can also watch longer term interactions. So we can follow these single green tumor cells. And again, these are red blood vessels. And we can follow these individual tumor cells over the course of about two weeks as they grow um, into metastases. 
And the hope with this research is that we can find interactions that are required for metastasis, and eventually we can, we can block those interactions and use those uh, for therapeutic options. So thank you. I should tell the presenters, feel free to move the microphone up if you need to. Um, um, so thank you, David, for a home run presentation. Um, I've, and I almost, I'm almost going to make it through the night without referring to the cancer cells as green monsters, but all, not quite. <laughs> all right. So we're going to move. Uh, yes. There are going to be a lot of them. I'm sorry. If you don't like them, you no, don't leave. Just stay. All right. So we're going to head a little bit further east out to Revere Beach for our next image. Um, this next image that we have is striking uh, for a number of reasons, um, in part because it is, in fact, the first, first ever winning image from the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering, which is very exciting. Um, and I told someone that, and they said, well, what's it doing in the Cancer Research Center then? And I said, there are a lot of reasons. Um, one. The, look at the, the judging criteria for our image awards. We're looking for visually stunning with a, a compelling scientific story. Uh, this does that. Um, the other reason, our contest is not just for cancer research. It's not even just for biomedical research. It is all um, life science imagery. And we very much, as the Koch Institute, value our place within the wider MIT research community. So we are proud to interact um, with a number of different departments, whether or not they have representation in the building. Um, we're part of the ecosystem, and I think we all share something in common, which is that these, um, something that we tried to say in our event invitation, because re regardless of discipline, the microscopic worlds that we study have big implications for how we live our lives um, and how we interact with the world around us. And that, to me, is what this contest really celebrates. Um, I'm thrilled that Stephen and Vicente share that vision, and so I'm going to invite you to sit back, relax, and enjoy some seafood with the MIT's mic uh, Environmental Microfluidics Group. Thanks, Erica, for that nice introduction. Uh, go forward here. So, I'll start by reminding everyone that the ocean covers about 70% of the surface of the globe. So in fact, we live on an ocean planet. Um, and because of its scale, the oceans affect practically all organisms on Earth. In fact, about half of the oxygen we breathe is produced in the ocean. In Norman Stocker's lab, we study microbes that live in the ocean. To do this, we dramatically scale down the way that we think about the ocean to hone in on a drop of seawater that's collected from a local beach, Revere Beach, in fact. Each drop of seawater hosts a lot of different types of microbes, and all of them are made of carbon-rich matter, seafood, and they interact with each other. We often use graphic illustrations like these to communicate the significance of these microbe-microbe interactions, but in our project, we have brought these drops of ocean into the lab to directly observe them with video microscopy. Here's an example of what that looks like. In this movie, you're seeing dozens of different bacteria, which are the black and white dots that are swimming around a very long diatom chain. Diatoms are a type of phytoplankton, which are floating microalgae. The accumulation of bacteria seems to be strongest near the surface of the diatom, and that's because the diatom is releasing carbon-rich matter, which we playfully called, again, <coughs> seafood. We don't see that material in the movie, so we'll represent it here in the green. Bacteria can measure different concentrations of this material over time, which causes changes in their swimming and turning patterns such that, as a population, they end up accumulating near the source, near the, near the, near the diatom surface. And that process is called chemotaxis. It turns out that seawater has very low concentrations of carbon-rich matter, so bacteria are competing for very uh, scarce nutrient resources. From the perspective of a, phyto, uh, from the perspective of a bacterium, a phytoplankton is like an oasis in a desert. It's like a nutrient-rich hotspot. And so the ability to swim confers an advantage to some of the species of bacteria. These movies have allowed us to be quantitative. And in fact, these are the primary data sets for our studies. From these images, we've been able to determine the precise locations of individual swimming bacteria. And those were critical pieces of data for a mathematical model. That model helped us to predict how much carbon food gets consumed by different bacterial populations competing with each other, and how much of that escapes from the local hotspot 
and gets released into bulk seawater. So here we're seeing another example of these interactions, though with a slightly larger field of view. And besides the challenges in actually recreating the environment in the lab and doing the direct observations, there's also some slightly more practical challenges in handling all the different data sets. And so as we were working on this project, we were looking for a way to have a quick overview of all of our different experiments in order to do a quick comparison without having to do the full analysis, track all the individual bacteria, uh, et cetera. And that led directly to the image that we submitted for the, the Coke gallery here. Uh, now, you see in this video, I mean, basically a video is just a series of images uh, separated by time. And if you look at the differences between adjacent images, you'll, you'll highlight the factors that are moving, importantly the bacteria here, and, and you'll de-emphasize all the things that are not moving around. So if you take a series of differences of adjacent images and compress them all into a, sort of an artificial long exposure, and then you superimpose back the diatom, which wasn't moving, you get uh, our result for the image. And here you can see in blue the tracks of individual bacteria, particularly around the periphery. And if you look carefully, you can see some of the evidence of the chemotaxis that Steve was talking about in the, the sudden reorientations that you see in those tracks near the diatom itself, the individual tracks blur together due to the broader effects of chemotaxis, which is the aggregation of all these bacteria near the source of, of the seafood. Uh, now, I should mention, of course, that the video that you saw was in black and white and grayscale, so the color here has been added just for clarity uh, to, to the components that are moving. Now, although this is an overview of a single interaction between diatom and bacteria, uh, it's also part of a bigger picture. In particular, uh, microbes like this support the marine food web, which include in the ocean things that we would typically think about, whales, dolphins, and fish. Secondly, it's really important that due to the abundance of these microbe-microbe interactions, they have a dramatic impact on the ocean carbon cycle, which includes the distribution of our carbon dioxide in the ocean and therefore all over the globe. So to just um, continue on with what Vicente was describing, microbial activities in the ocean then are truly important for our existence as humans. And as oceanographers, we study these microscale interactions with the long-term goal of understanding the biological, chemical, and physical processes that make the ocean function across all scales. In closing, we just want to thank again the Koch Institute for this fantastic award. And we'd like to briefly acknowledge the um, colleagues in the Roman Stocker Group as well as the uh, following sources of funding. Thanks very much for your time. All right. Yeah, when I met with Stephen and Vicente, I was struck. So we were struck initially by the, the visual of the image, and then when I learned um, what went into it by the science behind it, but really their passion for what this work was really impressive, and I think that's true across the board. We get very excited about the work we do, the discoveries we make, um, and whether it's fundamental biology or new technology or the combination thereof, it's a really, really powerful experience. Um, so, and I won't tell the audience how many titles we went through before we settled on seafood. Um, but I have to admit that coming up with titles is one of my favorite things about my job. Um, and so this was, this was a fun one. Uh, this next image, we suggested lots and lots of titles and ultimately came back to the one that the researchers suggested in the first place. Um, this image uh, from the Irvine Laboratory was created jointly by a cell biologist and a nano nanoparticle engineer. Um, and so it's, it's, so License to Kill is an incredibly accurate image, uh, description of what this describes, and it also highlights something that biologists and engineers have in common. Um, I'm, of course, talking about a love of James Bond movies. Um, good versus evil is a very common theme on the big screen, and I have to say cancer immunotherapy, which is what this image is about, um, is a prime, it, it's due for a feature film, I really think. Um, it's one of the Koch Institute's uh, major research focus areas. Uh, basically, what we're doing is hacking the body's own immune system to help them fight cancer. Um, and so this is actually, I find this an injection of hope, especially after seeing what the immune system did to Andrew's device there. Um, but this is literally an injection uh, of nanoparticles, and I will say of hope. So here to tell you exactly how that works is Kumari. 
Suda Kumari. Thanks, Erika, and thanks for introducing the title. And I'm going to tell this story where we are going to realize that title actually has a significance to play in the story. So the title, License to Kill, actually refers to, um, all right, yeah. So it refers to a special ability of a set of immune cells to find and kill target cells. So the use of immune system cells to target cancer or as we say, cancer immunotherapy is a really popular and uh, promising way uh, to target cancer that has uh, emerged in recent decades. And a big part of immune, uh, sorry, a big part of the Irvine Laboratory uh, uses immune system cells called T cells uh, for this purpose. And the reason why we use T cells is because, first of all, they are robust uh, uh, traffickers. They have really robust surveillance properties in the body, which means they actually travel around the body looking for infections, uh, which also means that they can be used as a vehicle to tag drug-loaded cargo on them, and they'll take the drug everywhere in the body. Then they, all, uh, they already have a natural ability to kill. Uh, and they don't just kill any cell, OK? So they only. <laughs> So they recognize a particular signature on the target cell and kill it. So uh, the, these immune system cells are already equipped with an ability to identify the target cells and kill them. But a lot of things go wrong when cancer happens. So for example, cancer cells can orchestrate a program that suppresses immune system and the cells of the immune system. So because of that, immune system cells don't function as they're supposed to function. And T cells also, they are not able to uh, function properly and kill the uh, tumor cells. So one way to get around that is basically to take T cells out of the body and engineer them to function better in a test tube. So we do that by using these small particles called nanoparticles that are filled with drug. And they can be loaded onto the T cell. And when the drug is released from these nanoparticles, then it's going to help T cells uh, that are carrying the nanoparticle, as well as when the T cell reaches the side of the tumor in the body, because it is a robust trafficker, uh, it will, when the drug is released, it will also help other immune system cells, or the neighboring cells in the side of the tumor. So when you think of the tumor environment or the microenvironment, it's actually, so we envisage it as a warfare zone. So there's a constant battle between tumor cells and immune cells. And in that situation, if we send these uh, T cells that are they have been engineered to carry uh, nanoparticles, then effectively, uh, we're going to help even the surrounding immune cells when the drug is released, as well as the suppressive effect of the tumor will be broken, and the tumor will be eliminated. So the image that I have essentially captures the same battle scene. Here, you can see there are two, so there are two uh, tumor cells, which are pretty large. They are melanoma cells. And they're being attacked by the T cells that are small round cells. And these cells are carrying these nanoparticles that are coded for coded in yellow, which will be releasing the drugs. As you can see, the cell that is being seriously attacked by T cells is already dying, weakened by T cells. It's showing signs of early death. And we hope that the other cell will also go through the same stage so that the tumor is eliminated eventually. So okay. So where are we going from there? Uh, one thing is clear that we want to eliminate melanoma, we want to target the tumor, but it's a complex question. There are a lot of small, well not small, but a lot of uh, barriers to therapy uh, in melanoma. And in our lab, we hope to combine tools uh, from different disciplines of science, including cell biology, material sciences, and immunology and bioengineering to understand the property of T cells that we can harness to make more effective therapies. Also to find biocompatible materials that are better and more adequate uh, for loading onto immune cells, effectively engineering the immune system to mobilize the immune system uh, against tumor. And for that, we hope to combine everything and work towards uh, coming with uh, better and better therapies. Uh, <laughs> and uh, this will come up with solutions uh, that would um, the, the most optimal solutions for uh, therapeutic challenges that cancer cells pose and come up with therapies that are uh, effective, safe, and, and cheap. 
So with that, I'd like to close and I'd like to thank Daryl, my mentor, Yiran, who is the co-creator of the image, and uh, the biotechnology core at Co. And the image was taken as the at the uh, Whitehead Institute Bio Bio uh, Biological Imaging Facility. And I'd like to also thank everyone in my laboratory, as well as the T cell group within the laboratory, and the financial support from HMI and NIH to Daryl. And if you want to know more about the immunotherapy story, of course, I am here and many people from Irvine Lab are here. But also, uh, if you want to have more compelling uh, uh, visual insight into the process, then you can also check out this YouTube video. Uh, it was created by the outreach office at Koch last year, and it essentially captures the same theme of uh, T cells fighting the tumor. Thank you. Yeah, so since Suda mentioned it, um, I, and I happen to be the public outreach coordinator at the Koch Institute, um, I will put in a little plug here for things like our cancer immunology flash mob. Um, this, this With Insight program is part of a larger outreach program um, in which we want very much to communicate the research that happens at MIT and in the Koch Institute to the wider community. Um, so these, uh, these events are uh, more research-based talks, um, but we also have a lot of, we have a school field trip program and we also have family-friendly programming, such as these flash mobs, which we have been running for the last three years um, it, at, as part of the Cambridge Science Festival. This year for the Cambridge Science Festival, we have an open house on Friday, April 24th, so mark your calendars. Um, we'll have researchers from many different labs as well as hands-on activities to explore the research that we do here. But it's a lot of fun and we really want to make what we do accessible because uh, cancer is a disease that touches all of us and the more we understand it and the more we're working together to fight it, the better off we're going to be. But back to the Image Awards since you really didn't come to hear me talk about our school field trips. Um, the, our next image is going to move us away from uh, mystery spy action and into science fiction, but I promise you everything that Carrie is going to present is real and truly happened in a laboratory. Um, unlike the Borg, uh, so resistance is fertile is our next image, and unlike the Borg, this is not a story of assimilation. This is an ass this is a story of differentiation. Um, the Samson Lab, uh, Carrie comes to us from the Samson Lab, which is part of the Koch Institute. It's part of the Center for Environmental Health Sciences. It's part of the uh, the departments of biology and biological engineering. So you can tell there's a lot of brain power there. There are a lot of brain cells um, at work. So I'm not entirely sure why they felt the need to grow new ones um, in the lab. But luckily, Carrie knows, and she will tell us more about her image. Uh, thank you, Erica, for the introduction. Uh, so as you mentioned, my name is Carrie Margulies, and I'm a graduate student in the Samson lab. And for the past 20 years, our lab has been studying how alkylating agents affect cells. So alkylating agents are classic compounds that damage our DNA and can cause cell death, making them highly toxic. Additionally, these compounds can cause uh, cancer. Um, in the interesting paradox, though, is despite these hazardous effects, alkylating agents are widely used in hospitals as chemotherapy. Though the drugs offer benefits to the patient, I'm sure we're all familiar with some of the debilitating side effects that can occur, including hair loss, nausea, fatigue, and chemo brain, um, characterized by loss of memory, attention, or motor control. Uh, moreover, alkylating agents often cause secondary cancer years after successful treatment. And all of these side effects are caused by severe sensitivity to alkylating agents in very particular cell types. And we're interested in learning why certain cell types are sensitive and why others appear to not be sensitive. And how can we determine whether a cell, whether it's healthy or cancerous, will respond to alkylation treatment? So to answer this question, we're studying two cell types uh, specifically, embryonic stem cells and neurons. Uh, in previously published results, our lab has shown that these two cell types respond completely differently to uh, alkylation treatment. And I don't have time to discuss it further right now, but the caption in the gallery explains some of the science a bit better. Uh, or you can ask me at my image later tonight. I'd be happy to discuss it. So embryonic stem cells are unique uh, in that they can develop into any cell type 
they want, basically, depending on specific growth conditions. And from that logic, we can induce stem cells to become neurons uh, in lab, a process called in vitro differentiation. Uh, this allows us to study changes in sensitivity to, alkylate, uh, to alkylating agents by treating both the initial stem cells uh, and the resulting neurons and comparing their res uh, responses. We can also assess when the cell response changes as a function of the uh, developmental process and identify features that determine cell sensitivity or resistance. Uh, in practice, the differentiation technique is accomplished by allowing the stem cells to aggregate into clusters, um, which are then grown in particular growth conditions that will selectively allow the development of the neural tissue. So my winning image uh, is a snapshot of the differentiation process. The original cluster of stem cells is shown on the right in the blob, um, and the neural cell types are growing outwards to the left. The blue in the image is the cell nuclei, the green are the neurons, and the red are astrocytes, which are supporting cells found throughout the brain. So the protocol I explained on the, on the previous slide takes three to four weeks to accomplish, so it's not a short protocol, and there's a lot of room for error. And after all that work, it's very encouraging and motivating to look under the microscope and actually see the cells that you were hoping to create. Um, and it's results like these and, and beautiful images that uh, make me excited to come back to work every day and keep trying the protocol again and again to, in order to optimize it. So thank you, guys. All right, thank you, Carrie. Um, so the next image is also about uh, benchside discovery with bedside applications, but rather than treatment, we're actually looking at diagnosis this time around. Uh, so KI researchers actually work with a number of medical practitioners. We are a basic cancer research center, so we don't see patients, um, but we do work with uh, doctors, physicians, clinicians, um, whether it is uh, our own in-house clinical investigators or um, our, our institution-wide collaboration with the, the, our bridge project with the Dana-Farber Harvard Cancer Center, um, or just on a lab-to-lab -lab, uh, lab-driven lab basis. Um, so this is, this is one of those. We're going to visit the Heinz lab again, um, and their focus on metastasis and this extracellular matrix, right? healthy cells interacting with tumor cells. Um, and, and this is an image taken within the large intestine. Stefan Rakelt is going to tell us about it. But I, one thing that I want to emphasize especially is that as much as we're studying this particular um, protocol within the colon, the work that we're doing has implications for a wide range of organs and different cancer types. So Stefan. Thank you, Erica, for the introduction. So, uh, as you said, I'm also from the Heinz lab, but uh, not working with fish, working rather with human tissues. And this is more important since you have seen the first couple of pictures, and they have been based on fluorescent microscopy. But if you're going to translate these into clinical uh, application, they are rather not that useful because immune fluorescence with specimens uh, bleach pretty fast. And if you're using, like, like me, a different approach, which is immune histochemistry, you uh, actually can uh, can get pretty nice uh, images too, but they are uh, in, in, in difference. You can use them and store them for a much longer time, and you just need a normal, fluores uh, normal light microscope and not like uh, expensive equipment like a fluorescent microscope. And we in the Heinz level, actually, my project, I'm trying to set up this uh, system of immunohistochemistry and try to uh, apply and translate data which we got from previous uh, studies on proteomic approaches where we compare different types of cancer including colon cancer, um, and try to, uh, try to find microscopical um, essays which we can then translate for routine pathology. Um, so this is the image I submitted. It was uh, actually now ended up to be circular uh, but, and upside down. But this just shows, <laughs> but this just shows you a, a quick overview, uh, uh, a quick section through the normal human uh, intestine and showing you the two most prominent cell types, which are in red. Uh, the, goblet cells, which are mucin producing, and the uh, enterocytes, which are uh, the water absorbing cells, uh, surrounded in the connective tissue. And it just rather took this image for a documentation purpose in the beginning to set up uh, the system with two very well-known markers uh, used in clinical pathology. This is uh, the mucin-2 and the keratin antibodies. And on this left side, you can see this is rather the overview on where I took the, took the image from. And you nicely can see that in healthy tissue, uh, you have a pretty nice organization and really regular form. 
But on the same scale, on the right hand side, you now can see the same thing in colon cancer. But the structure is not organized anymore, it's completely messed up. And, but what a pathologist still can tell, uh, tell you from this, using the two markers I used, they can still give you the origin that this is, an, is a tumor which is originating from the intestine. But the pathologist can't really tell you anything in this case now about a treatment um, application like therapy, non-responding or responding therapy, or does the tumor have metastasized to any certain place. So this is what we are trying to do in the Heinz lab, especially what Erica said, using the exocellular matrix. Um, and so we study the exocellular matrix during tumor development, um, including also the metastasis, and trying to find such kind of markers which pathologists can uh, use later on. So I'm also starting out with immunofluorescence, like you see here on this image, and this gives you an overview on the pipeline we kind of have developed and set up in the lab. So we're testing the new markers using fluorescent microscopy, using uh, them on different tissues, human tissues, uh, seeing if they are reliable and really reproducible, showing results. Then you go in the next step to uh, immunistic chemistry, and what I said, you just need a, a light microscope to observe it, and this is what clinical or routine pathologists use on a daily basis and uh, you can store the images quite long. So what we're using in the next step is we're trying to use an auto stainer to really set up the markers we have, we have found and we have established to really have like constant and uh, constant results uh, throughout our system. And um, also applying this single markers on a high variety of a couple of different uh, tumor types. So slide scanners in the next step we use to really make uh, images uh, like you can see here that you have like overviews, you have really a database you set up and you always can go back because you can use this on a PC screen or a Mac screen and uh, zoom into the different areas like the image I presented today and you always can talk to different pathologists and they can give you the opinion on that. So how this now looks um, in clinical pathology usually, I'm not a pathologist but so this is an H and E section, and so this is what pathologists deal with on a daily basis. And this is a section through uh, through a colon, spe uh, colon cancer specimen. And you nicely already can see, or pathologists can tell you, you have like normal tissues up here. You have like a starting invading front of a normal uh, of a colon cancer, but you also have like deeply infiltrated uh, tumorous tissues. So pathologists can tell you in this case um, all about like the single single cell morphology on what's happened on the section. Uh, we can tell you about the tumor crate depending on how far we, uh, the tumor cells have spread within this, uh, within this section. But we can't tell you anything about like clinical outcome or later use, uh, like, like what I said, like where do, the, uh, where do the, the tumor has metastasized to which organs. And so if you're now applying the system we used and we're trying to um, do a panel of different new markers, and this is one of his immunohistochemistry stains, which I just did on the same section using one of the markers I'm interested in, which is from Respondin. You clearly can already see from the overview that um, you don't have any kind of stainings like you can see here in the normal tumor or in the normal colon. But like in the deep infiltrated areas, you have a bright stain for this marker. So this is just an example um, of one of the stainings we have right now. It doesn't tell you, doesn't allow us to tell very much right now, but it already tells us a really tissue-specific staining pattern within these uh, tumor areas, in this case, like in the deeper infiltrated areas. And we are trying to, um, or we're working together with pathologists on a big variety of his uh, tissue samples and different grades of the samples, and um, trying to uh, correlate all this data we get with clinical data, where we know about therapy uh, and therapeutic outcome of the patients itself. <coughs> And um, so hopefully to find patterns like subtypes, which we can stain with specific markers um, in this case, um, to really hope to improve clinical pathology routine uh, use uh, of, the, uh, of, the, of the different markers we are applying, and hopefully also to improve uh, therapeutic strategies in the course of colon cancer and metastasis. So to hopefully really develop kits which we can help uh, diagnosis for patient treatment, uh, for patients' treatments. So I want to thank uh, Richard and the Heinz Lab for their whole support. I have to mention all uh, the collaborators we have at MGH and Dana Farber to give us all the specimens because it's pretty tricky to really have like the tumor side with a metastatic side for comparison. I have to thank uh, Yoshi because she is doing lots of the scanning uh, using the slide scanners for me, and I definitely have to thank like the people from the histology lab in our building because we are helping pretty much all the time with all these auto staining set up or troubleshooting. And thank you for your attention.
Right. Thank you, Stefan. I think um, one of the reasons the judges chose this image was because it was very different than some of the others. And Stefan told you a little bit that most of the images we've seen so far are immunofluorescent are, um, fluorescent images, and this is a different way of looking at it. What I think this image also says, and what Stefan's talk really illustrated, is this, that images don't, all, don't just tell us what the world is, they tell us what might happen, the predictive power of images. And I think we've seen that um, in other, other images today as well, being able to draw conclusions about what is and what could be. And I think we're all very excited about the possibility. So. Um, our next image, again, like medical diagnosis, the, the science that we do is not always black and white, but for some reason, the winning images from the Hammond Laboratory always seem to be. Um, again, channeling the awards lingo, this is the third win for the Hammond Lab. Um, and like the microneedles and the biopolymer scaffold that came before, uh, it's getting up close and personal with promising technologies. Um, when I interviewed Nasarg and Nassim about this image, they spoke very eloquently about the differences and the overlap between, need, between curiosity-based discovery and need-based discovery. And this image really captures both of those things. Um, and I like that about the image. And I also like the fact that the technology used to create this image um, is widely used to develop water filtration systems. Um, but I don't want to spoil Nasarg's presentation, so I'm going to invite him up to tell you a little bit more about this image. And uh, Anne and Kevin, this is the moment. All right. That will make sense. Cool. Thanks, Erica. Um, so I guess before I start, um, <clears throat> we have some uh, of these particular kinds of materials that we've developed that I'd like you guys to see. Um, hopefully, it'll get through to all of you. If not, uh, please come find me after, and I can show it to you. Um, so uh, I am uh, a recent graduate from Professor Hammond's lab. Um, I am a chemical engineer by training. Um, as as uh, is Nassim and uh, and of course Paula, um, so uh, during I guess my my uh, research uh, experience here in the Koch Institute, I've been very fortunate to work with extremely talented people, um, and one among them is is Nassim. Uh, unfortunately, he couldn't be here today, uh, but the image that you guys see is essentially uh, a, a joint effort in which. Uh, Nassim helped me sort of image one of the materials that I was very interested in working with. Um, and so um, for those of you who've seen it, uh, you, you probably know what it looks like. But for those of you who, who haven't, um, essentially, um, macroscopically, uh, if you just look at it, if you just hold it up, if you, if you feel it, um, essentially, it looks, it looks like paper. It doesn't quite feel like paper, but it, it looks like paper. Um, and uh, but during our conversations with Erica, um, we sort of were trying to come up with a, with a good title. And we settled on Into the Breach. But sort of the question that you guys might have um, is, where is the breach? I mean, this looks like paper, right? I mean, there's, there's nothing really wrong, uh, per se, with the, with, the, uh, uh, with the material. And so the answer I would have for you is, are you really looking close enough? And um, we, as, as scientists, like to investigate things, really like to uh, get in and get uh, get get uh, sort of uh, into the material that we're we're working with, and so um, we, we kind of went about thinking about different ways to characterize the material. And one of the ways we went uh, about doing it is is using a microscope. I'm guessing pretty much everyone in the audience today um, has worked with a microscope at some point in their lives. Um, we, um, being in the Koch Institute and at MIT, have uh, the ability to really uh, image these materials at a, at a very, um, very high magnification. And so that's exactly what we did. And it turns out that um, when you look at this particular image that, uh, or this particular material that some of you have seen already, um, uh, and, and this is magnified about 5,000 times, um, you really see a striking and repetitive pattern. And sort of this is the image that you guys look at um, outside. By the way, it's the only black and white image in the gallery this year. So. That's, that's really nice. Um, so uh, 
the so some some of the features and and I'm happy to talk about you uh, individually if you're more interested. But uh, these are sort of um, pores uh, that are present in the scaffold material that you guys are looking at, um, and and uh, this allows us to do a lot of uh, very interesting things. And I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, I should mention the material that we use is biodegradable. Um, so once you put it in the body, it kind of breaks apart, and you really don't have to worry about it too much. It's made of clinically approved materials, and it's one of those things that we think is quite readily translatable uh, very quickly in the clinic. And so one of the things that uh, the Hammond Lab works in is uh, uh, an approach that we call layer by layer uh, coatings. Essentially, these are coatings that we apply to different surfaces and different substrates uh, for different applications. And I, I won't get into uh, the details of the technology today, but what I will say is that we, we took that technology that we're, we're very good at um, working with um, and coated this scaffold with, uh, with molecules, with therapeutic molecules, um, such as uh, proteins uh, that naturally induce your body and the cells within your body um, to, to do very specific things. And I'll talk about that in a second. One of the things, so I mentioned pores. So one of the things that the pores uh, help you to or, or help us to do in this uh, context is really develop a res reservoir for these proteins uh, in which uh, we can uh, sort of release these proteins in a very controlled manner or not release them at all depending on the application that we're looking at um, and so it kind of allows us to form a kind of a depot if you will uh, for these molecules um, I, and one of the phrases there uh, up there is phase inversion so Erica mentioned this so this is a process that's used fairly uh, commonly in water separation and developing materials for wa water filtration uh, applications. Um, and so very quickly going through it, it's a very simple process. Essentially, you coat a glass plate uh, with this material, um, just throw it in water, and you end up with a freestanding polymer membrane. Um, I do want to mention the two applications that we're looking at, or we've looked at. Um, one uh, is in the area of regenerative medicine, essentially trying to repair or induce the body's own cells to induce repair. Um, we've looked at bone tissue and mending broken bones. Um, I'm happy to talk about that later on. This is a histology image of uh, one of the bones that we've regenerated in the body. Uh, the other application we're looking at is potentially using that as a cancer vaccine. Um, and again, I'm happy to talk about that uh, in more detail with you later on. And uh, we're a little bit further um, further on in the regenerative medicine application, and it's, uh, it's something that uh, a company is currently working on to, to move it into the clinic. Um, so the one thing about the Koch Institute, and I do want to mention acknowledgements, um, uh, is, is the ability to really interact with scientists in different disciplines um, and also uh, within the Koch Institute as well as outside. The two people I want to mention um, are uh, Bob Langer and Sangeeta, who've been very instrumental in helping us uh, develop some of this, uh, some of this work. Uh, and of course, the Swanson Biotech core and the, and the people there have been um, just fantastic in, in helping us trying to uh, characterize these uh, things and, and try to get these in a, in a sort of a presentable manner and, and really be, be able to get us to the, uh, into the science of these things. Uh, I mentioned folks outside the KI, so we have uh, very, uh, very good and very helpful collaborators at Harvard Medical School. I mentioned some of them up there um, who've been uh, extremely helpful in, in helping us uh, uh, really trying to get a more into, or, or try to characterize the biology uh, a little bit better. And uh, of course, funding sources, uh, the bulk of this work has been funded by the NIH, um, and we're, we're very fortunate to have, uh, have, have their support. So thank you. Hey, thank you. All right, so now we're gonna head out of the breach and into the Petri dish. Um, I was really excited when this image was chosen, um, both because of how striking it is visually, but also because it represents what I think is a very, very important part of what MIT does. Um, the Undergraduate, undergraduate Research Opportunity Program, also known as Europe. Um, Daphne, who created and submitted this image, is a sophomore uh, working in the Gupta Laboratory across the street at the Whitehead Institute. Um, but there are many, many Daphne's uh, in this building and across all of MIT, undergraduate researchers with projects 
completely their own um, that contribute not only to their own academic development, but also the discoveries of their lab and their chosen fields. Um, and I think this image is particularly um, indicative of the, this contribution because not only does it illustrate fund some fundamental biology, um, it also provides a new approach to the scientific processes that we engage with every day. I said there are lots of Daphnes. That was figurative. There really is only one Daphne Superville, and she's going to tell you about her image. Hi. Um, so I'm Daphne, um, and I'm a Europe student at the Gupta Lab. And one of the main things that the Gupta Lab is interested in studying is the development of the human mammary gland um, and applying what we know about the normal human mammary gland to better understand um, what goes wrong in cancer and what happens when someone gets breast cancer. Um, now, it's difficult um, and both, both difficult and expensive to study the human mammary gland or any living system in an actual living organism. Um, so for this reason, a lot of scientists tend to create models or in vitro models to recreate what happens in the body uh, in a petri dish. Um, so that's exactly what we do. Um, so what our model looks like is we basically take uh, a sample of norm normal human breast tissue and cut it up and get single cell suspension and then we kind of clean it up. So this is an example of um, a terminal ductal lobular unit, which is just the end part of the mammary gland. Um, so what we do is we take out all of the white and yellow cells that you see around, which are basically just used um, for structural support, and we purify it to get just the um, purple and pink cells. And we add those cells to a 3D matrix that has um, different proteins and nutrients that are both present in the human body and also required for these cells to grow. Um, and so when you put these cells into the 3D matrix that we use, um, you get a structure that looks like this. Um, so I think the structure alone is really informative because if we go back to um, the figure in this first slide, you can see that the structure here looks a lot similar to this black and white photo. Um, but in black and white, this really doesn't tell us a whole lot. Um, it doesn't tell us where the pink and purple cells are. Um, in the previous image, they're organized into two distinct layers. And when we put them into a single cell suspension, they're all mixed up, kind of like a, like a trail mix. Um, and so we don't know if when we put this, these cells into the, the matrix, if they stay all mixed up or if they reorganize themselves or if they organize themselves differently. Um, and so this is important to know to see if we're really capturing the essence of what happens in the body in our model. Um, so what we do to answer this question is um, a procedure called immunofluorescence. Um, and so the three main things that we tried to capture in this image um, were progenitor stem cells, um, because if you have a structure like this and you're taking it straight out of the body, you hope that you have some of these progenitor cells that are responsible for the creation of the structure. Um, so that looked like this in red. Um, but alone, this doesn't, this is just like a bunch of red spots in black space. Um, so we tried to get a little bit more information. Um, so what we also looked for was the cell nuclei to give us a closer, more finer look at the individual cells. Um, but then again, this is also just a, a spotted kind of outline of the original structure that we saw. Um, and then we also stained for a protein that provides cellular support called actin. Um, so this gives us a, a whole cell kind of view. Um, but again, individually, this doesn't give us as much information as we're really looking for. Um, so what we want to do is combine the three. Um, and we end up with an image that looks like this. Um, so, and I think what's really most striking about this, this image, and my favorite part, um, is that when you look at the, the stem cells in red, they're all kind of organized either in the middle of the structure or towards the beginning of all the branches. Oh, thanks. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So they're all either here in the middle or at the beginning of these branches, which is really cool because if they're the progenitor cells that are dividing to create all the other cells that these branches are made up of, it makes sense that they're at the beginning and then they're dividing and it's growing out. Um, so yeah. Um, but still from this image, you can't really tell. So this is a 2G image, obviously it's on a, a screen. Um, you can't really tell that it's three-dimensional, and obviously in the body it's, it's going to be three-dimensional. 
Um, so another thing we did is the microscope we used to create this image was a confocal microscope. So it allowed us to take um, different slices throughout the focal planes, uh, different fo focal planes of the image. Um, and so combining all these different slices of images, we were able to create a video that showed the um, three-dimensional properties of the structure. Okay. There we go. Um, so yeah, so it just rotates a few degrees and you can see um, that the structure is clearly three-dimensional. Um, so what we're really hoping to do next, or I think this model could really go in a, a lot of different directions, um, but one of the main things we're looking to do next is find genes um, that are involved in the initiation and the progression of cancer. Um, and so by maybe turning on or off these genes in the cells that we originally seed into this matrix, we can see how the appearance of these structures change um, when you change the gene expression. Um, so just a few people that I'd like to thank um, before I finish. Um, my advisor, Dr. Gupta, for letting me Europe in his lab um, and also for letting me be as involved as I, I feel that I am in a lot of the research that goes on. It's really cool and it's, it's hands down been the best experience uh, of my short, so far, undergraduate career. <laughs> um, um, also, Dan and Ethan, um, who are two of the best grad students that Europe could ask for. Um, they're really so much fun to work with. Um, also, Catherine Yushang, Dexter, Rob, and Sandia, everyone else who works in the lab, because um, it's just a, a ton of fun to hang out with you guys every week. And um, also, Wendy, for teaching me how to use the microscope and, and getting me so excited about taking these kinds of images, because it's, it's really fun. Um, and my parents, because they're, they're always a great source of support and for coming up here and, and, and watching this, this presentation, so thank you. Thank you, Daphne. I love seeing the processes. Um, it's something that we don't always see when we're judging the images. We see the result, but I think sometimes the process of creating them is even more exciting. All right, so looking at the clock, I'm going to uh, move us very quickly through this image. This is in the galleries, but we don't have an official presentation about it. Uh, this is the image that was created and submitted to the Welcome Images Image Awards uh, in London. We have, ever since we've opened our building and our exhibition, we've had an exchange program with the Welcome Trust. Um, this is the image from London that our judges chose for display. It's metabolic diversity, um, um, but enough about their image. Let's talk about ours. We have one image that is appearing in the Welcome Exhibition, which opens next week. Um, that is uh, this image, Easy Breezy. Um, and this is, I suppose, the image that is uh, standing between you and dessert. But no pressure on Greg. He's going to take us on a whirlwind tour of actually a lot of what the Koch Institute does. There's metastasis. There's drug delivery. There's immunotherapy. There's the microscopy core. There's a lot going on in this image. Um, and Greg is going to share it with you. So take a deep breath, because here we go. Thank you, Erica, for keeping everybody's expectations very low. Um, <laughs> as a brief connection to the previous image, I'd like to also acknowledge my, one of my many great Europe's, um, Adelaide, uh, who is also in the audience. I'm going to force her to stand up and take a bow. Yeah. Right. And then our um, great uh, intravital microscopy core image scientist um, who runs a really great ship um, in the Institute also. Um, so I think that this, uh, in particular, this building was really neat when I first came in because I think it's the only research building that I've worked in where there was actually a gallery in the bottom. And I think that this display and this series of images and this whole competition is just a really great exemplary um, showcase of what imaging um, can do in terms of science um, and how impactful it is in terms of conveying information. But it also really helps us um, figure things out. And that's what this image does for my project in particular. Um, I should note that um, I also kind of embody a bit of, uh, like many people in the Coke, I embody a lot of the different um, elements of the Coke. I'm an immunologist, I'm an engineer interested in cancer, I'm a writer, I'm a photographer. I, at any given time, there's a hundred things going through my head. So 
Um, I apologize, because <laughs> now you are subject to that. Um, I think we're in a really great uh, position in biology because for many diseases, we have a lot of great targets and a lot of great drugs. But really, um, it's been alluded to in previous presentations um, in this session that a lot of these drugs have side effects and they may or may not target things that are specific to a specific disease. And so um, really, uh, there are a lot of problems with drug delivery in particular that need to be optimized. Things like toxicity, how we dose things, ensuring that patients get the right doses, that they, can, that they don't overdose, um, that, we, uh, that we can actually formulate the drugs that we actually design. And that's really one key area of my research is drug delivery. And so when thinking about engineering and drug delivery, um, we really have started focusing on the lungs because um, if you think about specific drug delivery and trying to minimize side effects, most drugs are delivered systemically. You get a pill, you get an injection. But there are also a lot of different organs, um, like the lungs, that are readily accessible in really simple ways, and we're already doing targeted drug delivery without even de overly designing the system. And this is the engineer in me kicking in. It says simple is better. And so um, what I like to th uh, think about when I'm thinking about this project is the classic inhaler scenario. An asthmatic, um, and everybody is very familiar with this, um, multiple puffs a day, very easy, very simple. What if we could do this for cancer? What if we could do this for an immunotherapy drug? If we could do this for an anti-cancer drug? And where this really kicks in is that the lungs are a major site of not only metastasis and a driver of mortality and a wide variety of cancers, but it's also actually a primary tumor site. And so really what my project in this area is looking at is can we kind of hijack this r route of delivery and actually deliver drug depots that can help lungs reject metastases? And so this is what... Um, a human looks like, this is what a mouse looks like. And the mimic of this in our system is actually intratracheal delivery. So we actually put an intubation tube into the trachea of a mouse and then chuck a bunch of particles in it. Um, and so um, we label our particles with a red fluorescent dye. And um, this image is actually um, one of a series of images. And miraculously, what you can see is that after a week, this is a lungs extracted from a mouse after about a week of um, living with these particles and it's perfectly happy and it actually nicely mirrors this red distribution pretty well. And so what this really gives us is organ level scale. It tells us that we're covering the entire lung, which is important, and that this de uh, delivery method is a poten potentially really useful. The other really interesting thing is scale. Um, a lot of people have gone really small. I kind of like to have my cake and eat it too. So this is actually over a thousand images condensed all into one 2D projection. And if I wanted to, I could force you to look at a rotating 3D guy, but I'm not going to. Um, it also would take forever. Um, but um, I used the same microscope um, that Daphne, um, a similar microscope setup that Daphne used. And um, that's kind of what gives this that depth um, but I was also a little bit lazy and I kind of didn't want to actually make sections of the lungs, so I just took the whole lungs out and I just imaged everything. And that's the award-winning image. And so I think um, as a scientist and a photographer, it just really is fascinating to me day to day how many ways and um, in different um, realms that the arts and the sciences, you know, intersect. We aren't actually that far apart. The intuitive processes, thoughts about design, how we communicate information, it's all in the same boat, in my opinion. And with that, I'd like to conclude and acknowledge, um, first and foremost, my um, lab mentor and advisor, Daryl Irvin, um, and my co-winning lab mate, um, scored two of the images this year. So. Um, and then also acknowledge the Swanson Biotechnology Microscopy Corps in particular, as well as the Koch Institute Galleries and the Welcome Images Trust for um, letting me come over to London. Um, and this is all funded. Um, the NIH funds me through an F32 fellowship um, for my research. Um, and um, in particular, I'd also like to thank um, the uh, first annual, I guess, uh, Herman and Eisen Travel Fellowship. So Herman was actually a preeminent immunologist on our floor who um, it unfortunately passed away last year. So I'm very, very grateful to be 
uh, the recipient of that travel fellowship to go to London. And of course, the Koch Institute's core center support. All right, thank you, Greg. Actually, it is me now between you and dessert, um, but um, so I just want to say that concludes our lightning talks. Um, I will also I'll remind you one more time about our hashtag KI images. Um, tell us what these images mean to you and also point out our next With Insight program coming up on April 30th, uh, which is Blood, Sweat, and Pioneers, which will combine history, cutting edge cancer therapy, endurance th uh, sports, and chemotherapy resistance. So it's uh, bound to be a fun program. So in conclusion, I just want to say that I hope we have inspired you, shown you a diverse selection of research ideas and methodologies. If you would like to learn more, please visit the KI website or follow us on social media to be kept abreast of the latest developments. Um, and, and then I want to leave you with a final message. There are many layers to our work. What we do takes guts. It has to happen under the right conditions. Um, it is everything we do, discovery, fighting cancer. It is a battle worth fighting. Um, our presenters and collaborators will be available at the end. They'll be available by their images in the galleries for questions, but please try not to swarm any one person at once. Instead, let me encourage you to spread out throughout the galleries to revisit the images with a newfound appreciation for the science, technology, and stories behind them. Um, and while you're out there, please enjoy some sugary treats that we're fairly certain your immune systems will not destroy. Thank you very much.